can start. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to host uh, today three distinguished uh, speakers to discuss Ukraine, uh, which uh, definitely remains a, a topic. The conflict in Donbass is far from uh, frozen. The ceasefire regularly breaks down. Uh, you have a lot of discussion in recent days on resetting the formats for the settlement of the, um, of the conflict. So should there be a revamping of the Minsk uh, agreements or should there be a peacekeeping operation? So we have all this discussion about, uh, about the formats of the settlement of the, the conflict. Also in the US, the perspective of um, little weapons deliveries to Ukraine is still uh, debated. So I think it's another issue uh, that maybe we will touch upon today. And uh, also uh, in Ukraine, a presidential election is coming rather soon in 2019. So I think your coming here is quite uh, timely and I thank you for being here. I know your schedule was quite uh, busy uh, while you were in Paris. And so today we will discuss uh, not only the conflict in Donbass, but also uh, related issues uh, such as the progress or lack of progress, you will uh, tell us, um, on an important part of the reform agenda in post-Maidan uh, Ukraine, that is the evolution of defense policy and uh, restructuring of the armed forces and security sector in, uh, in general. So I'm not going to spend uh, two precious minutes uh, in um, reading your biographies. Uh, you can find the biographies in the, in the file. Uh, the only thing I would like to underscore is that the three of you, I guess, you take part to the <coughs> uh, work of the Carnegie Ukraine Reform um, uh, monitor team, um, and uh, I think it's a very precious tool for all the people who have an interest in following uh, Ukrainian uh, developments. Uh, and I invite you to take a look uh, at the French version of the latest uh, issue of the Bulletin de la Réforme Ukrainienne, uh, which has been published uh, last uh, last month. So I think, by the way, that this is the right moment to to thank uh, Carnegie Europe for the support uh, it has provided in organizing this. Uh, event. So I think you have established a kind of a division of labor among the, the, three, uh, the three of you. Uh, maybe I will give the floor first to Anna. Uh, Anna Shelset, who is a senior researcher at the National Institute for Strategic Study. No, well, from where you got this bio? <laughs> uh, I was sent it by uh, your colleague at uh, Carnegie Europe. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's start from the beginning. <laughs> okay, so you will present yourself yes. <laughs> in a better way. Okay. And so I uh, we have also Thomas uh, Deval, a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe, and uh, Natalia Chapola. Chapeau Valova, uh, a Kiev based uh, contributor to the Ukrainian Reform Monitor team. So uh, I would like to stress that the dis uh, discussion is on the record. So uh, this is important to mention. And uh, maybe, Anna, uh, if you're uh, ready, the floor is mm -hmm. yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Forget about the biography. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 it's material. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I used to work at the National Institute of Strategic Studies under the president, uh, but I left two years ago. That's why I was so surprised that um, uh, you named it. Uh, I work for the, I'm founding member of the Foreign Policy Council, Ukrainian PRISM. Uh, it is one of the main think tanks advising in the sphere of foreign policy, especially for, for Parliament and for MFA. And also I'm in charge of uh, this journal that I left for you, Isabel. It is the Ukraine Analytica, the only Ukrainian English language um, journal, um, quarterly. Uh, and many of the issues that you are interested in, they were covered in one of the previous um, issues as well. So it will be, I hope, additional source of the information uh, for you. Uh, my specialization is national security and conflict resolution, so I understand that we don't have that much time, uh, so I will be jumping uh, on the different topics, trying to underline some of the issues, but I, as we have and we want to leave as much as possible time for the Q&A, what is more interested for you, so feel free to ask me uh, um, anything about the peacekeeping mission of the vision of it uh, from the political level, uh, definitely uh, about the uh, uh, probably NATO integration or division from Ukraine and the uh, um, foreign policy of, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
that's my expertise where I lay and as much as possible. I am also based physically in Odessa, so on the south. So if you need the regional perspective, I also will be glad to um, comment uh, um, on this. And as we were discussing, like definitely we are not able to cover all reforms happening after 2014. So I'm not going to speak a lot about of them, and especially because yesterday I see some of the familiar faces from the yesterday conference, so I know what uh, Alexei Semeny uh, talked about there. Uh, I have a privilege to skip uh, this idea uh, and th these topics, and I will concentrate a little bit more on the security uh, sector, especially from the strategic point of view. It's necessary to understand that definitely 2014 became the uh, watershed uh, for Ukraine in terms of understanding what does mean security. Let's be honest that most of the strategic documents that we had before, and many of them were changed in 2010, 2012, so they were very fresh. All these documents were like, you know, national security strategy. It was very um, a strange document that didn't define anything. The threats were global. <coughs> Everything what is happening in the world. So you could take our national security strategy, gave it to another country in Europe, and believe me, it would suit perfectly. Um, so we were completely not understanding what can be threats and challenges. We put in the national security strategy everything from, I don't know, pension reform to the uh, uh, military reform. It was about everything. The second problem that we had, it was so-called non-block status. First of all, you can't find anything like this in the international <coughs> law. What does it mean non-block status? It was just a political decision dictated by Russia that non-block means non-NATO integration. Because no other blocks in the language existed at that time. Uh, in some way, it was the substitute to the neutral status. And that's why now, when somebody is telling us that the uh, neutral status of Ukraine can be one of the solutions for the conflict to exist, at least we as an expert accept it very negatively, uh, not because of the concept of neutrality, but because we are saying, come on, in 2014, we were de facto neutral. Did it stop Russia from the actions in Crimea, from the annexation, or from the war? No. So the question is not in our neutral status. The question is more in the control uh, over the territory. Uh, 2014 was definitely the period of just um, cosmetic changes, as we name it. We didn't have army. We didn't have security services. Uh, both because they were highly infiltrated, but also physically, military didn't have equipment, didn't have the uniform, they didn't have the medical kits, they didn't know how to fight because there were no money for the real drills. Um, so the first year it was just the necessity of the first quick changes. <coughs> And 2015, it was that year when we started to think strategically, and you can find our new national security strategy, new military doctrine, but we started to think wider. At that time, you can find 2016, 2016, we have the information security doctrine, and you have the uh, um, cyber security doctrine. And what is very interesting that cyber, for the first time, if you open our military doctrine, um, you can read that cyberspace became equal to land, sea, and airspace in terms of the war terrain. For the first time, and unfortunately we learned by practice, uh, because a lot of things were done in the sphere of cybersecurity in terms of protection of the infrastructure, when we had cases of attack when Western regions one day appeared without electricity because it was hacker attack at the electric stations. So our military started to understood that contemporary war is not only war of uh, um, tanks, even that Eastern Ukraine showed that tanks are still relevant. Yep, the war was uh, back to the, uh, to the ground and classics. But it's definitely also cyberspace became the same important. And information security, I even tell you the uh, um, insight that the first text, information security and cybersecurity, it was one document. 
and only after very long and tough discussions with the experts and civil society, we persuaded the ministry to divide it into two documents because we explained that different mechanisms involved and if we really would like to deal seriously with this, you need to, to put it as two different documents. And they became much more efficient. But the third change, which is very important, is that Ukraine not only set threats, but it's also underlying how we see ourselves and the protection in case of security. Before 2014, let's be honest, we took a lot of money from NATO and our institutions for security sector reform, for defense reform, and did nothing. It was not controlled, it was no vision, no strategy for this. In 2015, it became very clear that NATO integration would be important for us, and that it is becoming the national security goal, but not because it is anti-Russian. It is very important to understand all this uh, propaganda going on that it's, Ukraine would like to be pro-NATO just because to be anti-Russian. Completely no. The main idea is that NATO is seen as the most developed security structure in terms of standards of armies, in terms of interoperability, in terms of cooperation, the level of control and operation. From whom to learn, if not from NATO? Should we learn from Chinese how to reform our army that we need to build from the stretch? All biggest and most developed armies are NATO members in this case. So for us, it was logical choice of standard. Yep. When you would like to become better, you, you have some idol. And uh, Article 5 also was important, but in terms of solidarity. <coughs> Because we understood in 2014, when annexation of Crimea happened, a lot of people were replying. At that time, I was working at NATO Defense College. And I was panicked, like, why are you not helping us? Why are you helping Mali? Why are you not helping Ukraine? And the answer was, like, you're not part of us? And it was honestly very frustrated for Ukrainians, like, we are part of Partnership for Peace. We have the distinctive partnership agreement. We have all this arranged, but you are more eager to help Mali than you're eager to help Ukraine. That's why, and we understood that Budapest Memorandum is not working at all. So we were seen in Article 5 as something like panacea for, for anything. Definitely in 2017, we became much more pragmatic. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we are not asking for protection, but we are asking for reform uh, of how to protect ourselves. And if you see the latest documents of 2016-17, you can see that Ukraine would like to reform to be able to defend ourselves. And in the latest statement of the president to the parliament, it was said that we first of all trust to our army, which we would like to advance, and we definitely would like to have all the assistance from, uh, from our partners as much as possible. So here is come not only strategic vision, but on the tactical level. We started to adopt completely new annual national plans of cooperation Ukraine-NATO. It's still very far from perfect. Uh, we as the experts have a lot of questions, but that is all at the same time completely different document from what you had five years ago. This document clearly stated what are the priorities, how we should be changed, uh, what efforts we are ready to invest uh, there. And also, these plans are much closer to, uh, in some way, membership action plan in terms of logic, what is put there. So you see the rule of law as an equal chapter of this annual national plan as the military reform. Uh, on one hand, we see problems in this, because, like, why you put these questions as well there, but it is requirement of NATO towards Ukraine, the same for Georgia, because they emphasize that you can't have only strong army if you don't have um, other spheres being like, like corruption, like rule of law, like judicial reform made that can uh, uh, really make your uh, societies resilient. So this new term appeared that we also need to build resilience, not only um, defense. Uh, luckily, it is some kind of understanding within Ukraine that all this necessary. But at the same time, in terms of reform, 
uh, it is the under like because the war is only at four percent of the territory of the country. Other regions would like to see other reforms more in the top priority than the military and defense reform. For them, where they don't feel and don't see the consequences of the conflict, uh, they definitely put anti-corruption topper than the security reform, uh, higher in the priority list. The judicial <laughs> reform is put at the priority list. Investment climates are put in the um, in higher uh, list that um, maybe sometimes attention paid uh, to, to uh, these by some parts of the Ukrainian establishment. We can't say that all, but we see the efforts spent in, in all of these um, uh, directions. Um, I would probably pause here, uh, just not, have, not to have a monologue. I will give uh, a chance to, for my colleagues to speak as much as possible, and then uh, I will be glad to, to to jump back to the end. Like I, I didn't start with the peacekeeping now, just to have a logic of it. But uh, I will be glad to return back to the vision of the peacekeeping operation as well. Yeah, also, I also will introduce myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for the last, uh, since April, basically 2016, I'm based in Kramatorsk. It's in a city in Donbas, in government-controlled Donbas. Until end October, I worked for the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, and this mission was. Um, invited by Ukrainian government in March 2014 to uh, document and monitor accountability for human rights violations during Maidan. But then uh, the annexation of Crimea happened and then the armed conflict in Donbas, so the mission switched its focus on Donbas. And it's a unique mission in a way because it's uh, um, it's represented on both sides of the contact line, so I worked in Kramatorsk office covering Donetsk and Luhansk regional government-controlled uh, territories, and, uh, but there is an office in Donetsk, and they cover um, armed group-controlled territories of Donetsk region, and also an office in Luhansk, and they uh, focus on Luhansk uh, armed group control. And then there are also offices in Odessa and Kharkiv. And, uh, um, um, this gave me basically a wealth of experience because uh, part of my job was talking to people. Um, I don't know how many people I talked to. Uh, uh, we went to villages near the contact line, we went to detention centers, we monitor trials. Uh, so many things that I will be talking about also based on kind of my first hand experience of uh, talking to people who live uh, in Donbass. And uh, I will suggest with the fact that uh, basically this armed conflict in Donbass, uh, Anna said that uh, uh, it's like 4% 4, 4 of the territory uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, when you are there, you also see how it's perceived, how distances kind of tend to um, stretch and then shrink. And what I'm uh, trying to say that basically the contact line is uh, something um, invisible in a way, but then very visible if you live there. Uh, it's, it's basically front line in most cases. Uh, it means that parties are very close to each other and sometimes they can see each other, sometimes like 500 uh, meters away. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you don't need to be very uh, close to shell because you have more than ulteriorly that you can shell a city from 90, uh, 90 kilometers like Kramatorsk was shelled in 2015 uh, from very far. Or we had recent cases of shelling less, uh, let's say, more mortal, but still um, this year. And then uh, some parts of the front line are relatively calm, and mostly in Luhansk region. My um, kind of explanation to that that there is a natural frontier, it's a river, Seversky Donetsk River, that separates the parties, and there is no kind of uh, um, stimulation for advancement or change in the position. So people, even though they kind of live very close to the front line, they have relatively calm lives. I mean, it's all in brackets in a way, but I mean, but they suffer less from, from shelling, but from other, um, uh, let's say, consequences. I will tell about them uh, mm. later. But in some cases, it's very, it's a hot spot because frontline is basically, it's within some uh, um, municipality, a town. The town is divided by the frontline, and people still live there on both sides, and there is military presence within these towns. They basically live in the houses of civilians and they shoot and in fire, and of course, this is like the most dangerous places to live. But there's still some civilians living there, including kids. And um, sometimes it's uh, basically, it's also um, like uh, the front line around Donetsk. Donetsk is basically was the biggest city uh, in the region, it was the capital. And uh, uh, it means that also that shelling involves a lot of damages to infrastructure, and to civilian houses, and unfortunately also a loss, a loss of uh, life and health. And this is the areas where the most shelling still takes place. And um, 
uh, basically the figure that we, um, the UN is kind of trying to collaborate with civilian casualties. There have been uh, more than 2,500 civilian lives taken by the conflict. And the estimations of uh, those civilians injured uh, during the conflict between seven and uh, 9,000. This is, in addition, you have those people who died, uh, uh, 298 who died on the airplane in July 2017. And uh, we, we don't have uh, good figures on the um, loss of um, sites, I mean, military casualties, because some um, sites try to hide them, but uh, what the government, Ukrainian government, um, said it's like reaching 3,000 in, in killed and then. Uh, many more injured, and then there are so-called uh, non-hostilities casualties. I mean, the government should still have to explain what they mean, but there are many people who are dying in the conflict zone, but not from the uh, direct attacks. So it can be sometimes, uh, yeah, murders between, I mean, military or some other kind of like, incidents and so on. Uh, uh, or maybe sometimes we, or the like, society also people uh, suspect that the government tried to hide the official figures by this uh, non-hostilities figures. And then, of course, uh, there is no um, unified uh, state register of how of uh, casual civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, the UN and the OEC they're collecting figures, but the government mm -hmm. is kind of not having. They do not have a register mm -hmm. of um, people who suffered from the conflict, and there is no register of uh, civilian property, uh, both private mm -hmm. and the private individuals and companies mm -hmm. damaged during the conflict. So the figure, I mean, the, the uh, again, humanitarian actors they try to kind of to map, mm -hmm. but the amounts um, of them are enormous, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, the, in those areas that I mentioned, that the big cities and close to the contact line and shelling is ongoing. I mean. Uh, um, if you think of number of, because uh, I mentioned that there are the ceasefire violations have been regular, and I'll just remind you a little bit the story of the conflict. There was a September 2014 Minsk first Minsk agreement, and that's what stopped and st kind of stopped uh, major um, battles in August and uh, September 2014. And then there was another one uh, after Ilovaysk, and then it was another one, so called the Baltsevo, in January February 2000. Uh, um, at 15, and there was another second Minsk ceasefire agreement, and this is what the months like August, uh, July, August 2014, and January to uh, February 2015 were the most so I mean casualties happened, the most loss and the biggest uh, kind of battles. But uh, there was no single day when ceasefire was enforced. Yes. Basically, uh, violations of ceasefire mostly shelling, uh, artillery, but also small, uh, arms and light weapons are happening daily, and sometimes you feel. Uh, even uh, kind of amazed by the fact that, uh, for example, OEC, SMM, the uh, Special Monetary Mission, they counted that there were over uh, 300,000 ceasefire violations in 2017. And then you kind of also think, okay, it sounds good, that not so many people um, kind of were killed uh, or suffered. Uh, but then apart from this uh, sh um, damages to property and uh, lives and health, there are also um, Damages to infrastructure, and then all the and then serious violations of other rights that kind of conflict in a way imposes, and uh, it, you can imagine it's like basically two regions interconnected, and the front line goes mm -hmm. through the villages sometimes uh, over all through cities, and there was all kind of connections, uh, water flows, electricity flows, gas pipelines, and then of course the, due to the conflict you have those. In, that infrastructure damaged and people, for example, have to live without water or water is rationed and they have uh, like a few hours a day water supply or uh, there was several villages um, in the Nordic region that uh, there are, um, they were without electricity for over the year. So it means like uh, it's something basic that you think that you're going to have in this life. And there are still uh, places, I mean, there are less, uh, but still there are places there are no electricity, for example, since the beginning of the conflict. And it means also the population in the sense that people who are younger, they live, they try to leave the, the area, and especially those who have kids and they need uh, access to medical facilities, education, and those who kind of uh, are left behind are mostly elderly people, or people who cannot, the most kind of vulnerable, who cannot afford moving out. And then many people also return. Um, uh, I mean, I, will maybe, I mean, there are many, many issues maybe we can raise during the discussion, but uh, what I'm trying to show you that this, um, Damage uh, and hardship on civilians during the conflict is not only measured in the, in the I mean, in those destruction that we can catch with the eye quickly or the loss of civilian life, but also how communities function. For example, uh, also it, uh, also basically human relationships are affected in a way. Imagine you have one village and then through the river another one, and they have uh, 
part of the family were living on the other side of the river. They were basically taking a boat and going back and forth, and now it's a front line, they can't go, they're not allowed in order to go there. They have to go somewhere 200 kilometers. There is no public transportation, they'll have to pay taxi, and taxi costs more than their pension. So it means that they, there are families who are broken by the, in a way, by the conflict, their contacts are broken, they can talk on phone, but they cannot see each other, and children, and so on. And, it also kind of, in a way, triggers displacement. And then many people who, for example, were living in Avdivka, you've heard the place, it's one of the hotspots, and they were at, at just 15 minutes by car to Donetsk, and they would go there for work. And now it's not possible any longer, so people also deprived of means of uh, earning money uh, of jobs, and that's also uh, adds to suffering. They rely on humanitarian assistance, and, you know, four years uh, of the conflict, also international partners are less eager to provide Ukraine with the humanitarian assistance because, I mean, it's kind of, the hope is that the government will kind of manage and the parties of the conflict will manage to take care of their people, but it doesn't happen. And, um, well, what I'm trying also to describe is that this um, law, this huge damage and uh, um, loss of life and property and health, it affected this uh, and of relatively small, if you think of Ukraine, um, share of population. And many people, even those who live in the Donetsk or Luhansk region, like in Kramatorsk, 70 kilometers from the front, like, they don't really see the war, you know? They see military people in wearing uniforms in their city. There are checkpoints on the roads, but basically it's something that kind of became part of routine, but they don't, uh, they're not confronted with the war directly. And IDPs, displaced population, they're kind of well integrated. They don't live in the camps there. They have kind of rented flats, so they live with their relatives. You won't see them begging on the streets or living kind of from ghettos. So the war is, uh, it's invisible. Even uh, my favorite kind of comparison is Bakhmut, the small town, 15 kilometers from the contact mm -hmm. line. And then you go from Bakhmut, you take a car or a bus, and you go to Mayorsk. It's like one of the five official uh, crossing points where people can cross. And we're talking about six million people before the war living um, in this uh, area, in this region, and like five, five small crossing points with like one line, and you have to wait and queue and cross. And uh, uh, in Bakhmut, it's 15 kilometers. You've, and yeah, there are some military presence, but that's it. And then you go there. It's like less than 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes drive, and you see a totally different reality. And uh, that's why um, it's, I, I like these figures because and I said like 4% of Ukrainian territory, and then uh, when you look at Ukrainian media, maybe only uh, also there was uh, some studies uh, done of media content uh, between 4 and 6 uh, and 10% of media speak, uh, content is about the war. And even local media from the region is like 4% about the war. And th those media who speak most are mostly internet, not, not TV channels, which is the most, the most kind of common widespread use of how people get um, information. Uh, so, in, in a way, um, if you go, like I mentioned, like Kiev or any other place, the war is completely invisible. And also, if at the beginning of the country there were still um, um, armed forces who were drafted, they were drafted, they were mobilized, people would get this, you know, notification that they have to appear and to go to the um, uh, enlisted military enlisted office and kind of now people who uh, in Ukrainian armed forces or in other national guard and uh, the minister of interior they are on the contract so it's basically a job they take a job and it's it's a kind of different I mean it affects the families of course but it's also a different kind of relationship and uh, because there are no um, serious uh, I mean serious there are hostilities every day but no serious advancement the contact line is more or less the same since February 2015 I mean there are some changes but they are not. Um, and visible, and it's, it doesn't affect so much other people living outside uh, Ukraine. And uh, this is my point that I want to uh, kind of try to make that the war is kind of forgotten in Ukraine, if you wish to say so. Um, there was an opinion poll conducted and, um, in the autumn, and people were asked what are the main problems. And the majority of Ukrainian population, 70%, uh, said that the war is the main problem. People, people, people still, still know what is going on, and uh, it's there, but uh, then when you look exactly um, in the media, try to find information on how people live there in the, in the war zone. I'm not talking about territories that are not controlled by the government because there are no um, Ukrainian journalists working there. There's very little information on what is going on there. <coughs> but even on the territories that are under government, um, government control, you will rarely see um, kind of a story about um, how civilians live there. And even the, the, those pictures that are shown by the soldiers, I mean, the, the army try, tries to control what kind of journalists can get. So you cannot go to the um, 
in a conflict area on your own, you are kind of let, you are brought to places and you only get what kind of military wants you to get. And, and then in that way there are a lot of kind of censorship. And also self-censorship because journalists also are kind of afraid to, to harm their armed forces and national uh, defense capacities and so on. So they tend not to criticize uh, the army too much and be careful with how they show the conflict. And also the dominant narratives of what happened in 2000, 2018, they are also kind of you know, the, the language that the media use towards the people who live on the other side of the contact line. I mean, it's also sometimes not helping reconciliation and, and seeking the dialogue. And, uh, and my point is basically that, um, in a way, the government has forgotten those people, um, both living on the contact line on the territories and close to the contact line on the territory that the government controls, and, and also those who live on the uh, other side of the con contact line there, where the government uh, doesn't have effective control and uh, I mean maybe I'm saying some fact but that you know uh, but uh, since 2014 because there are no public uh, authorities functioning on the territory that are not under control of the armed groups the government cannot pay pensions physically to pensioners and uh, in a way to people to get pension they have to register as the displaced population on the government controlled territory and then only in that status they can receive pensions and it means basically, and because I, I mentioned that mostly who is left behind are elderly people, and sometimes people with limited mobility, it's, it's a huge uh, burden on civilians uh, to go to cross because there are only five cr official crossing points. Unofficial crossing points are <coughs> extremely rare, and then it's very dangerous because it's like minefields, you walk through a minefield there. Uh, and then, of course, it's um, you have to register, and then there are many processes of verification. You have to go to pension fund, to bank, and so on. It's a lot of kind of stuff that the government tries to restrict access uh, to pensions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the main argument is that we shouldn't finance the terrorism, but then um, many people who have right to pension because it's like their property, uh, they don't have it. And uh, the government says that once we have control over the territory, we will pay them all their accumulated debts. But I mean, it has been almost four years of the conflict, and people also are helping people are dying, and then. Um, and what, what is also worrisome that um, basically, um, I mean, I also I will, I will be uh, frank, but uh, the feeling is on the ground uh, that means process is that because there are uh, regular meetings, but they cannot solve even small humanitarian kind of non-political issues like exchange of uh, prisoners or opening of additional crossing points mm -hmm. or kind of uh, disengagement or demining of areas. So there are less mm -hmm. because uh, recently there have been more. I mean, especially there were some months there were less shelling and. Uh, the country, uh, the states kind of managed to keep this ceasefire relations lower, but th then we saw how many casualties, civilian casualties, are due to uh, basically mines, unexploded randoms, or foreign booby traps. And even the low steps to demine some areas, so kind of to ensure a safer uh, passage and kind of more, less uh, accumulation and kind of degraded treatment of civilians. This, this, these issues are kind of are not dealt in, in this. When I worked there, Basically, we were saying that if you want an issue to be that, send it to Minsk. So that the idea was that if we, I mean, if humanitarian actors wanted to solve some issues, they would rather uh, try not to politicize it and solve it on the issue of, like, I mean, through I mean, this uh, so-called joint coordination and control mechanism. So not, not, don't bring it higher to Minsk. Try to keep it as mm -hmm. unpolitical as possible, and maybe you have a hope mm -hmm. that uh, you can solve uh, some issues. And there were some issues solved like that. There were some. Uh, prisoners exchanges, there were also transfers of uh, pre-conflict um, uh, detainees from uh, um, so-called Donetsk uh, People's Republic to Ukraine, and it was negotiated basically by, I mean, by the Ombudsman office and the counterparts in Donetsk, and, and there were some issues um, uh, solved, but still, I mean, there was no big exchange of prisoners since 2015, and uh, um, uh, mm, many issues uh, that of humanitarian nature, like for example, repairing the only uh, crossing point in Luhansk region, it's a pedestrian mm -hmm. bridge. Basically, it was a bridge that was broken, and it's still broken, and there are two wooden ramps, and it's the only place in Luhansk region where people can cross the contact line. And of course, if you when you see um, elderly women with sticks walking, you know, sticks trying to cross, or mothers with kids trying to cross, it's kind of an awful picture to see. And the sides were not able to agree on repairing the bridge. They were, they were able to agree to open, on opening other uh, crossing points. And in then they would blame each other, but for civilians, kind of, um, the hardship continues. I think I'll stop here on this <laughs> positive note. And then, uh, um. Thank you very much, and thank you. Um,
very much for the invitation uh, to be here at, uh, at uh, FRS today. Um, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, although I'm, I am covering Ukraine, so I will give a, a slightly shorter, hopefully, and, and um, more general perspective, because I am working on a project which is um, about um, separatist conflicts in Europe and the the issue of um, de facto states. These are states that are basically self-governing, which were formed as uh, a result of conflict, but are not internationally recognized or, or very or only very, very um, by a, a small number of states. And, and the issue of engagement with these territories. The three cases I'm studying are Abkhazia, Transnistria, and Northern Cyprus. But I'm also looking at... Um, at Ukraine, and I think there's some interesting parallels. So let me just me get just um, to broaden it out a little. Let, let give me you let me give you some perspectives um, on this issue of why these um, conflicts don't get resolved, um, and um, and maybe some insights into the Donbass situation uh, as a result of that. Um, it's clearly, in this case, Moscow's um, position is. An enormous problem, but we can't say it's the only problem why this why this conflict doesn't get resolved. So I think there are different phases um, in these conflicts. One in which people are still living together in the same state. Um, there is a breakdown of trust. There is violence, and this creates divisions. And the violence, I think, um, reinforces uh, new identities. Um, what it means to be a, a Greek Cypriot or a Turkish Cypriot, what it means to be an Abkhaz or an Ossetian rather than a Georgian, um, what it means to be uh, a Transnistrian rather than a core Moldovan. And, and, and um, clearly Donbass has no history uh, of conflict. It was always had a reputation as being a rather kind of sleepy, passive uh, area of Ukraine, um, that the people in Donbass, in fact, were people running Ukraine for various periods, particularly under Yanukovych. But I think um, I think the key point is here is that conflict does create a new identity, and the longer this goes on, the, we, the more we will see a consolidation of of a different identity. And we're already seeing this a little in uh, some opinion polls. Certainly, the um, the view of Ukraine of Kiev on on the people on the other side of the line of contact is obviously becoming more hostile and more solidified uh, over time. Uh, secondly, the issue of uh, the dilemma that faces all these uh, governments in what we call the metropolitan states, Tbilisi, Chisinau, um, southern Nicosia, the, the Republic of Cyprus, is about um, capacity building on the other side, about um, spending money in, in the territory that is broken away. The immediate impulse is don't spend any money there, um, punish them, isolate them. Um, and this line that we've just heard from Natalia, um, don't finance terrorism, therefore don't pay any pensions to people uh, on the other side. Um, and uh, the, the problem with this approach is that you alien um, there's a certain logic, there's a certain financial logic uh, to this. Um, but we saw, we certainly saw in Abkhazia in the 90s, there was a long period when the Abkhaz were not proclaiming independence. They were still prepared to have some kind of relationship with Georgia. But after a long period of isolation, they declared independence, actually six years after the war in 1999. Um, so um, isolation, I guess, um, therefore alienates the populations on the other side. They feel that they have no stake um, in the metropolitan state. And again, I think we're seeing this process, unfortunately, happening um, in Donbass. And of course, isolation also increases the dependence of these breakaway territories on what we call the patron state. So in the case of uh, northern Cyprus, it's Turkey. Uh, in the case of Karabakh, it's Armenia. In the case of Abkhazia, South, Ess South Ossetia, Transnistria, and Donbass, it's it's Russia. So it, um, we're now seeing the, the, the slowly the economy of these places oriented uh, towards Russia. We're seeing um, banks slowly opening, uh, which 
are working within the Russian banking system. We're seeing takeover of business um, with, with Russian money. So we're seeing a, this process of economic isolation has uh, the effect of, of increasing the dependence on the patron state. So I fear this, is, this process is also happening. And I think my final generalization is this funny dynamic in which um, we end up with a kind of status quo um, where there is no conflict and no resolution. And this is because at some point the metropolitan state becomes reluctant to reintegrate. This is not being talked about maybe publicly in Kiev. But let me thump th examples from my three other conflicts um, in which basically the um, Tbilisi, uh, Chisinau and Nicosia were offered a version of, in of integration, reintegration and said no. Uh, they, thought, they thought the cost was too high. In 97, in Ab Georgia, Abkhazia, there was an offer of a so-called common state. It was, was, was uh, from Yevgeny Primakov, then Russian foreign minister. Um, the Abkhaz reluctantly agreed to be in this common state with Georgia, and it was Tbilisi which, which rejected the proposal. They thought the cost uh, of a common state with Abkhazia uh, was too high. In 2003, there was the Cossack plan, Moldova Transnistria. Again, it was um, the Transnistrians said yes to, to this reintegration, and the Moldovans said no. The, the Cossack plan 2003 gave basically the Transnistrians um, a lot of power within this new um, Moldovan federation. It gave them a lot of vetoes, for example, on, on, on issues of foreign policy, which the Moldovan state said basically we don't want. We see this as a kind of Trojan horse. We get a reintegrated state, but we have this kind of Russian, pro-Russian Trojan horse in our state. And in 2004, obviously you know about Cyprus, the, the Anan plan, in which the Turkish Cypriots voted yes to reintegration and the Greek Cypriots voted no. So I think we're seeing this dynamic possibly beginning to... to the first signs of this dynamic developing in Ukraine, that... Um, that that um, a lot of people, I think, now in Kiev, that um, they don't say this openly, but if the the, the cost of a special status for for um, DNR and LNR within Ukraine would be too high, it would mean it would mean a pro-Russian region being given a special status. This could set a precedent for other regions of Ukraine, like Transcarpathia or Bessarabia. This would could be dangerous. We would see a large block of pro-Russian deputies suddenly coming back into the Rada, electoral politics would be shaped, would be the balance at the moment is towards pro-Western forces, the balance would tilt back in a different direction. Um, and you'd see a lot of uh, um, now economic responsibilities for reconstruction of um, uh, the economy of Donbass. So I think these, although people don't say this openly, you're, you're beginning to hear, at least in private, this, this kind of talk um, in yeah, in Kiev as well, which is so again one reason why this conflict is not being resolved, and then, and then this means that the paradox for Moscow in all of these cases is is that um, they get de facto control of a breakaway territory, whether it be Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, or, or Donbas, but they're losing the big, what is probably the biggest bigger prize, which is Tbilisi, Chisinau, or Kiev. Um, the Tbilisi, Chisinau, and Kiev. Three, um, three countries, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, which have got now association agreements with the EU, visa-free travel, etc., and DCFTA. And one could argue that they've got these perhaps more quickly than they would have had if, if they'd mm. been integrated with these breakaway regions. Um, that it's actually speeded up the process of euro intellect, which is absolutely probably the opposite, of what, almost certainly the opposite of what Moscow intended, but this has been the result. So I'm just throwing out this um, um, this paradox here, and um, Natalia is saying everyone thinks that Minsk is dead, um, and I, I would argue this is probably a reason why Minsk is dead, because Minsk, again, foresees this sort of loose federation, large autonomy, common state sort of idea, um, and I don't think, um, obviously we know the reasons why the Russians are not ready for it, but I think there are many reasons that now that, 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 that Kiev is no longer uh, acceptable in Kiev.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Let's now open the floor to questions. Uh, the first would be uh, for you maybe to come back to the idea of the peacekeeping operation. You said that you covered that in your recent research. Uh, I would be interested to hear more about it. And uh, of course, we can take uh, maybe a series of questions and then we, we, we go back to the speakers. Questions? Um. Oui, oui. Elizabeth, regarding the uh, oui, UN peacekeeping mission, and I have one question. To what extent uh, this kind of mission would be very, very useful to be deployed for? Because I have in mind the Georgian precedent, where there has been also, uh, already a UN peacekeeping mission in, uh, in Abkhazia, I think, during the 90s. A monitoring mission, but like the one Putin proposed, and uh, this did not prevent the 2008 war. So. Okay for UN peacekeeping mission, but uh, what for? This is my. Um... Two questions on oligarchs. Um, because this is what I observed when I was on the ground, that was a very important issue. Uh, one is on, on the ground. Um, I think one of the most important events probably this year was the fact that Ahmetov, Renat Ahmetov, uh, was lost, let's say, his uh, assets in, in the Donbass. And for me, it was really important. He's not just an oligarch and a heavyweight because he has a lot of money, but he has 300,000 jobs, I think, in his uh, companies in Ukraine. <clears throat> so he was a tool for, for Moscow let's say, to, to be sure that Kiev would remain in the sphere of influence of, um, of Moscow. So I don't really understand, I didn't work on that after, why, why he was deployed. I think it's a big game changer in the whole balance. And my second question uh, is that uh, the three countries we are speaking about, Moldova, Ukraine and uh, Georgia, finally are led by three oligarchs, in a way another one. And I think it's not by chance. Mm -hmm. And my question would be more specifically about Poroshenko, in which extent, and oligarchs, I mean, in a regional way, there are regional oligarchs, because in Georgia there is no oligarchy, there is one oligarch. <laughs> but he's an oligarch of the regional oligarchy. And uh, I don't say he's pro-Russian, it's more complicated, of course. So I would love to see in, in which extent Poroshenko is also part of this, him and, and others, of this regional oligarchy, meaning with connected with with Moscow of course and what does it mean thank you very much thank you, uh, thank you very much um, it's very yeah, very interesting to get these three uh, insights um, uh, I have a lot of questions but um, uh, I'll just keep it maybe to down to two um, uh, one about the de facto states uh, very often they have been also compared to de facto offshore zones, so from an economic perspective. Um, and um, so I was wondering if you have any comments regarding Donbass, because indeed you have also these uh, financial uh, transactions and links between uh, Donbass and, um, I can't remember if it was Ossetia, I think it was Ossetia and banks and things like that. So if you have any comments about that and whether or not there is some kind of uh, financial economic fraternization going on also with the Ukrainian uh, um, uh, uh, government control territories and uh, and economic powerhouses. Um, and my second uh, question is regarding uh, all these um, towns, villages around the contact line. Uh, to what extent uh, uh, does the decentralization plans affect them or not? I think officially uh, they haven't been turned into Ramade or anything. But uh, what is going what is going on there? And like, do they take into account what you were talking about? These uh, this reorganization of how people live and how they uh, how they yeah how they connect the, I don't know how they go to the market, how they get their pension money, etc. Okay. Maybe last question, Mr. Daboville. I think a free speaker raised an implicit question: Why the international community would do more? than that the, the people in both sides are willing to do. Because uh, uh, you have mentioned that there is a <coughs> lack of, a growing lack of interest, a kind of resignation to, to have a kind of Donbass like a Transnistria in Ukraine. And, uh, and that, uh, how the Minsk 
negotiator, which include, of course, uh, both sides, could, could go further, including in, in area like the humanitarian aspect that you described very well. I, I spent uh, last year, I had a, a course on that with students from Geneva and Paris, and they were aghast about uh, the, the way even the Kiev government was not reacting to the, to the embargo and, and so forth, the contact point, all that. But how the international community could force uh, the, the two sides to do more, first on the humanitarian, and second on trying to find a static, a kind of uh, uh, compromise, even if this compromise is like the Transnistria uh, and so forth. Trans uh, Transnistria works well commercially with, within Moldova. So, so it's a good example. And uh, uh, the EU, which is spending a lot of money, which has a commission which is in charge of watching the DFSTA, has done nothing. They have not even reacted when there was this, uh, this blockade of the line of contact. Uh, so they speak about corruption and all that. They are, they are not in, in really trying to, uh, to do. I, I'm, I'm, I think it's a big paradox. Uh, we know the problem. You have described them very well. But how can the international community could do more than the people really are trying for the reason which has been well explained? Uh, I'll pick some of the questions that I think more relevant to me. So first of all, about the peacekeeping mission. Definitely the variant that Russians proposed are not acceptable, not because it is Russian, but because of two points there. First of all, it is where to deploy them. The initial idea was the contact line. Mm -hmm. That's completely unacceptable because in this case we legitimize some kind of border and division. So there is completely no sense it would be more harm than the resolution. And especially because the contact line is something fluid, so it is not the exact administrative border of the region that it can be patrolled or something. So in this case, you are artificially creating the division lines, which already exist, but you are exaggerating them. So that is the first. Uh, and definitely the security situation is more important and the uncontrolled territories that are on the contact line. I mean, the, the threats are more. The second uh, issue is is uh, the mandate, because the initial mandate in what Russia still insists, it is protection of the OEC special monitoring mission. As the special monitoring mission is telling by themselves openly that they have two main threats, minefields and indirect fight. So now please explain me how UN peacekeepers can solve these two problems. To be border guards of SMM, they would not secure them from the minefields. Yep. In this case, you need the mission uh, for the mining. We already have the NATO uh, trust fund for the mining, uh, uh, but it didn't start like it's. But at least it, it's agreed. And definitely, the United Nations has the expertise, and it is classical for peacekeeping operation to be involved. Nothing political, pure humanitarian, important for all sides. Uh, that's why when you're asking, like, that's to explain why we didn't accept what was proposed, not because Russia, but just no logic in it. And we understand how much money and people needed for, for this big territory. So why to send people with no understanding, like, what is added value? What we can need, we definitely need the uh, uh, proper patrolling of the uncontrolled territory. It is protection and monitor of the military storages of the weapons that were uh, withdrawn due to the first agreements, because very often it is the in reports of SM, OEC SMM that they are coming and there is no weapons there, for example. So they can be um, uh, protection, let's say, or how to, guards for the storages of these weapons, uh, monitoring of the border, because Ukraine is not controlling the border and all trafficking of weapons and people are happening at the border, demining, uh, demilitarization in some way. We're starting from the first, because a lot of uh, missions can come, like, you know, with development. For example, the United Nations can help uh, with the organization of the local elections. You have security of them and everything. We saw it in many missions abroad, so it's something they can do. But on the first stage, we definitely need them as an additional security, but with the forces to do it, because SMM can just report, we heard these, 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 these. Uh, and the uh, uh, presence of the uh, additional personal, additional eyes, but with access to that territory, 
is very um, important. And here we can go to the uh, patrolling of the roads, for example, so to minimize these uh, uh, indirect fights. Yeah, because sometimes it's just suddenly you see a few drunk uh, uh, separatists who decided to shoot because of the fun, but because of this they provoked and it's continued. Yep, or some other incidents. So the it's more complicated, but that is what many of the UN peacekeepers were trained. Uh, there are talks about 10, 20,000 people needed. Oh. Now, uh, 10, 20,000 peacekeepers, yeah, uh, uh, that is talks, because as for me to speak about number of people before speaking about mandate mm -hmm. is a little bit illogical. Mm -hmm. But probably they compare the territory and the tasks. Uh, currently, the biggest UN mission is 90,000 people. One nine. It is in the Congo. So that is like with what approximate, but the budget of this mission for you to understand for one year is one billion euro. In you, in, yes, uh, that's like data of July because usually in summer, they, yep, they have this data. So try to imagine what number of everything we possibly could need in the best variant. So uh, that's like, do we need it? Uh, I think probably yes, because now currently, uh, but uh, without um, minimization of what uh, OSC is doing now, because OSC with all problems that we have with their mandate, with their access, sometimes with their staff, let's be honest, because in the beginning we had 30% Russians there, many of them military, people who were just reporting. Now the situation is much better, definitely, but I'm saying, let's say, beginning of 2014 it was disaster. But they already have the uh, uh, established contacts, mechanisms, procedures, something that can help the daily work that United Nations would need definitely time to establish. So it doesn't mean that if we bring UN peacekeepers, we say no to the OSC, because there are different formats uh, helpful. Um, one small comment about um, Akhmetov. It seems to me Akhmetov uh, kept uh, himself in the track um, in 2014, when he was investing in both sides. He didn't take a side in 2014. <clears throat> he even financially supported some of the groups at that time from other side of. And because of this, he lost a lot of trust uh, from, from all sides, yep. So he, he, he's the person now without the, without the real place. Uh, but definitely, uh, at the same time, he was one of the few allowed for the humanitarian cargoes to be delivered to Donbass. And that is returning to the um, uh, question that you raised about international community and others about humanitarian side. I would uh, jump only with the uh, one statement, because Natalia definitely had much better expertise. It was a period when most of the uh, uh, charity foundations and humanitarian groups were just kicked off from the bus. Mm -hmm. uncontrolled. From uncontrolled territories, yeah, from uncontrolled. It, re, it was period when Red Cross was prohibited to be at uncontrolled territory. Red Cross, we're not speaking about even private, yep. Uh, some of the people were arrested, some were just kicked off, some were kidnapped. Uh, it was one big uh, uh, charity from the people from the bus. Uh, and a uh, woman, the leader of it, she was not seen as pro-Ukraine. She was completely not pro-Ukrainian activist. She was the former deputy governor and was quite a, let's say, anti-Maidan position. <laughs> oh, very, even, let's say, she was not with pro-Russian position, but with very anti-Maidan position. Um, she was uh, arrested. And it was quite a serious uh, involvement of the international community. And the work of her organization, it was one of the few really allowed to be in the small villages delivering something. They were just um, took away. Uh, they were losing their so-called accreditation at the territories. So um, we need to understand that at that time, it's something like two years ago, yep, when the biggest happens of this. Uh, uh, things. Um, the trust was lost, the security feeling was lost, so it became much more difficult to deliver or to persuade somebody for the humanitarian work uh, because it was some kind of uh, frustration. If not Red Cross, who can work there? How we can be involved with this if we are not perceived as somebody legitimate there? 
Uh, but uh, we, we are speaking about humanitarian pensions. It's definitely more complicated um, thing in, in, in this case. But uh, why international community should do when we are not ready? I would disagree that we are not ready. There are things to which we are ready, to which we are not. Some of them because of the past uh, experience. We are not ready, not because we didn't have a wish, but because we had so many problems. Some is just not being ready because, let's be honest, Ukraine was not ready for the conflict. You want from our leaders, like, we criticize them a lot, but there are things to <laughs> criticize and there are things to, um, to assist or to facilitate because uh, you can criticize them when they have uh, to be so slow with anti-corruption legislation. Yeah, that's something they can do and it depends only on that. But conflicts, most of them are business People who never been in the conflict zones around the world. Who never if, if we stay on the security side, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the objections you have said uh, about the mandate of the peacekeeper are already discussed uh, uh, in the Steinmeier plan in Minsk. So the people in the border, on the controlling the border, all that. And, and there is linkage between all the problem and the status and so forth. So those problems are very well known on the table and they need a political push. Now the Steinmeier uh, plan is absolutely uh, comprehensive on that. But your object I am uh, surprised by your <coughs> objection about legitimizing the border. In fact, there is the border is enforced both by Donbass and Kiev on money and on, cross, uh, on crossing point. So it, there is already a border. In fact, it is better to have a border which is stable rather than uh, one which is moving uh, too much. And then the, the, the key issue for the OSC monitoring is the change of mining, of mining plans. This has been already discussed. Mm -hmm. you no, know, uh, with the mining let's say in some ways happening just like uh, currently according to many reports Ukraine, uh, that territory is one of the most uh, mined so we need all efforts possible so here it can't be uh, extra efforts there are that much needed that what we have currently discussed is definitely not sufficient but if we go to the contact line um, you know I spent quite a time in many conflict zones and I will tell you that the checkpoints that we have now, they are still not perceived as what can be when military people would appear there of the international community. I saw it in some other regions, and especially when it is military, not police people. Like for example, in Transnistria, and uh, as I live in Odessa, Odessa is just uh, on the border with Transnistria. Yep. When I need to go to Kishinev, I cross the uh, uh, territory. And uh, for many people there, the presence of military peacekeepers mm -hmm. means that it is war. It is still war. War finished 15 years ago, almost 20 mm -hmm. years ago in Transnistria. But for people, uh, foreign, especially military people at their ground, means that it is such a big threat mm -hmm. that no other questions discussed. When you have at least police peacekeepers, and that's what both Moldova and Ukraine insist for Transnistria, change them. Let it be peacekeeping mission, but let it be police mission, civilian mission. It would psychologically change for the population that the questions that they have, they are not military <coughs> threats. It is the more the criminal crossing, chicken passports, anything. Uh, and it's going on and going on. Let's be honest, in Serbia and Kosovo, it is still... I remember when I was kicked off at the Kosovo-Serbia border in the night. And the reason was I had Serbian visa, but I was coming from the uh, Kosovo territory. They said, you didn't cross the border properly, you don't have a stamp. I said, but Ukraine doesn't recognize in the plan. Like, I was playing, because for me it was Czech. I said, like, okay, but it is not the, um, Ukraine doesn't recognize independence of Kosovo. I'm at the territory of Serbia. Yes, uh, we I, don't I, care. I don't want to intervene more, but uh, mm -hmm. the Kosovo case is a very good case, because we have, the EU has been able to uh, manage an agreement between provincial collectivity for Pristina. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was not, it was not involving the, the, the states. Therefore, they were, nobody was losing face. And in mm -hmm. fact, those local arrangements sponsored by, and financed by the EU <coughs> are the kind of things which could be done if there was willingness on the two sides. And given the fact that we are 
going to have an election in uh, in Kiev. I am not very optimistic about the, the possibility to, to to have a consensus. It depends. Um, but I will give further for the questions here, but, just, but, but I will be glad to continue it further. I'll try to go quickly through all my questions. But I have not even done that. Um, I would not agree that he was pro Russian. He was not. Um, he was just trying to sit and go on, on, yeah, profit of trying to kind of keep his uh, business ties with the power. I mean, he had a business interest in Europe and Russia, and he was trying to do that. And he was a bit kind of, uh, I think, uh, lost the feeling of the moment. And many people are angry at him that if he would step up and say, I support Ukrainian unity back in April 2014, mm -hmm. and maybe. Some people believe that the war would not happen, and I'm talking about people who work for his enterprises who live in Donbas, so people who kind of are from the region. And now he is basically a major sufferer in a way uh, because uh, he lost due to economic blockade and then so-called nationalization, which is basically expropriation of private and public property and in uh, um, control territories. He lost uh, basically access to you know, his enterprises and so on. And then some of his enterprises um, that are on the contact line are also very negatively affected by the conflict and also by the fact that, for example, I mean, when I talked about gas supply and electricity supply, I talked about mostly suffering of civilian population, but also businesses are suffering from that. And some of his enterprises are suffering from that. Uh, at the same time, he's very involved in the region. And um, there are calls about like recognition by people of humanitarian actors. And his foundation, he has a humanitarian foundation, is like even sometimes before the Red Cross, so they're very, very recognizable. The only problem is that they were uh, basically not, they're not allowed any longer to work in their territories controlled by their armed groups, and basically it shows that probably they don't want to, I mean, they saw a kind of rival also in terms of political rival. Uh, and it, it affected a lot the population because very few agencies were able to deliver there. Currently it's only International Red Cross basically some small funds by UN, but they try kind of to do it very political. I mean, but the needs, humanitarian needs are mostly on that side. I mean, on this side as well, but also on that, on that side, and it's more tricky to fill them in. And uh, the blockade... His, his loss of his uh, businesses is coming first from Ukraine, I would say, because there was this blockade which was decided um, for local political no, no, reasons. came earlier. I mean, mm. uh, some businesses came earlier because, I mean, the contact line also imposes some restrictions, but there were still yes. um, restrictions were mainly imposed on civilians because some businesses were able to still use the railway and so on. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those. Like, that he was restoring. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, for example, bringing coal from the money he had there to his um, uh, plants that are working in producing, for example, metal or so on here. And that was that was the blockade process that stopped that. In a way, blockade uh, the, the blockade that happened in February affected more businesses, including him, rather than civilians, because civilians were, have been already affected before, mm -hmm. because the government has a list of goods that are kind of uh, allowed, and the rest is prohibited, like coffee, tea, uh, medicines. Uh, more than five of each kind. I mean, there are many restrictions on civilians that existed had existed before the, the blockade. And blockade was also kind of seen, I mean, it's one of interpretation of what happened. I mean, there are many. It's basically the president going against kind of his interest. But it's just one, I mean, I'm not uh, kind of defending him here. Uh, but he's still very visible in the region because he has this, um, like Mariupol, he owned this big, yeah. uh, big plant and the mayor is associated with him. You know, you've got the same, this power, the, basically the city exists due to this um, coke plant and he provides a lot of humanitarian aid, support and so on, and it's also portrayed that way. And um, uh, and basically the government, like so-called, I, mean, uh, I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit. I will not go more into details. But Poroshenko is an oligarch, I don't know. I mean, he's an oligarch and people knew whom they elected back in 2014 and... Um, but luckily, we have much more oligarchs than only one. Yeah, mm -hmm. Georgia and Moldova is one. I mean, we this have one was, was key for, of course, the, the severity issue. I'm comparing because before I was in, uh, in, uh, in, in one second, I was in, in, in Moldova and investigated a little bit of the energy issue, which is always a key issue that you have to look at it. And um, before the, um, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, almost 50% of the electricity consumed in Moldova was coming from Transnistria. And then it was more because you could not provide any more coal. So now it's something like 80%. 80% of this electricity is all produced in Transnistria. 
And then when you look a little bit at it inside, who is in, who is probably in the offshore company, of course, which is um, getting the the incomes from the sale of the electricity produced in Transnistria to Moldova, you found the pro-European oligarchs, Mr. Plahotniuk and his surrounding. So you see how a country can be tight by its separatist region. It's a bit different, and I don't know if it was intentionally, but in Abkhazia, you've got a big uh, uh, electricity dam. The dam, I think, is on the Georgian territory, but the water reservoir is on the Abkhazian. They have to share. It's 40% of the Western electric uh, electricity in the Western Georgia is coming from here, and then it's for Abkhazia. So you see how you oblige. And when I came back to, when I came to Donbass, I said, but OK, coal must be an issue. <laughs> Because it's a way also through energy, it's one of the many. Okay. You understand? I mean, uh, basically, the coal industry was subsidized by the government uh, uh -huh. since, uh, <coughs> I don't know, since the 90s. There were yes. uh, mines that were closed in the 90s and early 2000s. And the thing is, uh, there are not enough. I mean, the technology that is used is very medieval, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, not medieval, but it's like from two centuries ago. And that's why <laughs> the, the coal mining is not profitable. But at the same time, it's the business that, in, I mean, there's whole cities, and I mean, so it's not about towns, mm -hmm. that the only business there is mines, and people live out of it, and if they lose their job, they have, like, no, I mean, it's a catastrophe, and uh, uh, most of the um, profitable mines, they are now under territories controlled by them, the so-called VPR and LPR, mm -hmm. and the mines that are on this territory, they are the less profitable, and the government basically has many plans to close them, but then there are also kind of, uh, I think, this, and there were many actual mine protests this year and last year because the government was not, not in financing mines and they were not paying salaries and people were even like striking like underground and so on. But the problem, the government also, I think, um, I'm speaking of it, is a little bit afraid to close them now because they're, they're afraid that people will basically go and join their own groups or, you know, something like that because it's like means of. So I don't think, I mean, of course, uh, the, the, this transportation of my, uh, of coal through the contact line was important for Ahmedov, and I mentioned that because he had mine there, and this business was kind of linked to the, the, the production cycles. But he, I mean, he would be the only one to lose because uh, Poshenko doesn't have this kind of uh, business uh, related to the conflict. He, I mean, he not involved in energy business at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Like so he has he involved in energy business at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look to the uh, assets of Persian, it is mm -hmm. definitely media, it is uh, suites, it is uh, uh, construction, development, and it is the uh, um, machinery construction, like uh, buses and all this type. Mm -hmm. well, well, the the kind of thing. Oh, but oligarchy of the yeah, but it's about Ah, is not involved in energy. Well, the Donbass is on Kassi. Which is yeah. there's nowhere in Europe where you can have a casket. So mm -hmm. then, uh, and therefore, the power plant in, in Kiev around and so far are adapted to a casket. And when the embargo was done, which was a reprisal against Akhmedov by the, the man who had the, the bank, which was closed by the IMF and the EU, mm -hmm. was really a, uh, inflicting, uh, Kiev was inflicting it. A, 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 uh, on its uh, uh, own, because now they have to adapt the power plant, and they have to buy uh, a passive from uh, from Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. That they want to absorb. <coughs> The operation, of course, is, is the chocolate uh, oligarch. But, uh, an oligarch yes, is always working in network. Yeah. So what is important is our operation is rebuilding the oligarchy with fear cash, which is still not out of the game, mm -hmm. and so on, and so on. So this well, is more like... Yeah. Kalamoyski is his biggest enemy, so you mm -hmm. have another oligarch yeah. against so him, <laughs> you have others... Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and actually, yeah, could, you, could you give us like a little bit of an inside view of what is happening right now with the kind of oligarchy struggle with, uh, well, so you're living in Odessa, so with uh, Trukhanov, uh, who was... Trukhanov is not an oligarchy. Yeah, but I mean, he has a lot guy. of power. <laughs> he has kind of a lot of power locally, let's say. And also with Avakov, who is not, maybe not like considered as an oligarch, but he has a lot of power, let's say. So just can you give us a little bit of inside view of uh, how people are positioning themselves in, before the election in 2019. Yeah, well, she's working for herself. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, uh, Natalia will finish uh, with her logic and I will jump to the view. Yeah. The I mean, mm -hmm. there are not really, I mean, 
uh, how to imagine, uh, how to explain to you? Yeah, there, there was such a, a destruction of infrastructure and of uh, enterprises on the gov non government controlled territories. I mean, it's difficult to make business. They, they have this mind, they keep it, they sell their what they produce to via Russia. Some people said it end, uh, ended up in Ukraine, but I mean, I don't know, I never traced it. But the, the links that exist are basically with, for example, South Ossetian banks. It's for Russia, as far as I understand my understanding of it, to um, kind of for Russian banks not to be targeted by the sanctions because if they do it directly with it, so this is really the, I mean they build the links with South Ossetians and then somehow this money transferred from Russia to mm -hmm. um, Donetsk uh, or Luhansk, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to the DPR, the LPR to finance their um, parallel structure, their pension system, social welfare, and, and so on. But I, this is something that there is a lot of written on that, but I mean it's very difficult to, to verify. Uh, and uh, in terms of links with Ukraine, I mean. I mean, there is some smuggling going on through the contact line. There are also uh, journalistic reports on that. Uh, but basically, it, it, since the blockade, the trade is for, forbidden. And only like people can bring some, some like stuff with them, but it's like 75 kilos. I mean, there are many limitations. Mm -hmm. And also there are no bank links, no financial links, at least through the banking system. In cash, yes, and there were cases. But I mean, it's something, I mean, people say who live uh, kind of who are in the system that basically the law enforcement agencies, they live on some kind of smuggling and trafficking through the contact line. Mm -hmm. And there are some journalistic reports about it, but there are not many and uh, nothing ended up in the in kind of uh, official investigations as far as I know. I mean, some minor cases of uh, terrorism finance, like meaning that mm -hmm. um, there was some businessman who paid taxes, from Donetsk who paid taxes to a uh, so-called DPR. Yes, these cases are kind of persecuted, but... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as far as I know, officials mm. will be case. And then about the centralization and religious and near the contact line. I mean, the centralization, I think, something that people in Donbass, on those territories that are not um, near the contact line, but a little bit farther from the conflict, mm. like in Slovensk and mm -hmm. I mean, Kramatorov, they were post conflict. They really like the idea, and there are a lot of discussions and um, and um, local authorities and communities to discuss with whom they can kind of join forces, how to create this bigger um, communities to get mm -hmm. more funding. So it's the idea, I think that is very kind of good, uh, Donbass is very good field for kind of decentralization because they like the idea of local governance and getting more finances. And uh, the only problem sometimes is elections because the law is like that, that you have, uh, first you form this uh, bigger community and then you conduct elections into this bigger community and then after that this new election. You mean the Romada? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there are many places um, mm. where there have been no elections and uh, mm. for some reasons it's very difficult to get have elections for, like basically the main reason is security but I think sometimes it's more political as well. I mean... Well, political and money probably. Uh, uh, um, yeah. And then there are places near the contact line where you have problem of there are no civil authorities. I mean, there are so-called civil military administrations. I mean, they're run by military. People are appointed. There are no kind of uh, council, nothing like that. And uh, for that, it's even more complicated because the argument would be security. And then I think even if you can organize, I think in some places you can organize and have elections and election campaign and it will be fine, uh, safe for people. But uh, then I think the government is also kind of afraid who can be elected there. Or the people would vote. Yeah, I mean, because the, yeah. the government is so unpopular there. But I mean, uh, there. Yeah, okay. I mean, the, if you look at the uh, last polls, were showing that um, uh, around 12 percent of population support uh, opposition bloc in both regions. Mm -hmm. But 12 percent is not much. I mean, it's not like party of regions who had uh, at least an uh, over over or like absolute majority back in before the war. So. I don't think the people in, in the region they have a clear favorite. They don't. They are distrust brother everybody. They distrust the position. They distrust uh, uh, the government. They distrust. I mean, there is a lot of distrust in Ukrainian politicians in general in the region. So, uh, yeah, it's very, it's in that sense, it will, even if you can run elections and you can conduct them, I mean, I think the government. It's a risk. They see the government is like is afraid that they will not control. I mean, who is elected? And it's, it's just easy to point and point a military guy. And he will do. I mean, he has uh, some powers to. I mean, there are, his powers are limited, but he can. He can. He has powers to distribute money mm -hmm. and so on. And this is a bigger point because, um, apart from this local level, there is district level and regional level. And both in Donetsk and Luhansk region, there is the civil military administrations, but local um, region, regional council that should be elected, they don't uh, function. So it's one person who distributes the money in the whole region. So I mean, th there is a problem of accountability, let's say. But I think that the centralization is something that people in general um, like, and they try to benefit from it as much as they can. 
And about mm. international community, I think there is also a little bit of uh, like four years of the conflict, uh, humanitarian aid dependency uh, involved in the um, heads of some, uh, let's say, local and special regional governors. Mm. And uh, I've been, for example, to one meeting where the <coughs> government asked the uh, international community to come. And there were people from law enforcement, and they were saying, we need that, we need a scanner mm. for the railway, mm. we need a... I mean, they were basically a wish list mm -hmm. of things that are not really related to humanitarian response. And they were kind of demanding the international community to do it. And the same is with um, these crossing points. I mean, the crossing points is something that's outside the law in the sense that um, um, they're not regulated by the law. They're regulated by the um, sub-law acts. And uh, um, but still, I mean, even if you don't want to enforce the authorization in case, for example, the office where I worked, we kind of we tried not to enforce the authorization because we saw it as a kind of impediment and freedom of movement. But some agencies still want to provide some humanitarian relief to make people's lives easier when they cross. And it's very difficult to uh, work with the government in that sense because there is no single authority responsible. They would finger point at each other. Ah, it's who is responsible for crossing points? No one, because there is no law, no responsibility. So they would, they would finger point at each other. And in the end, it was all uh, a humanitarian organization who deliver basically from tea to medical aid to sheds. I mean, four years of the conflict, this thing's already stable. But the government, for some reason, doesn't want to take responsibility for this thing that it kind of imposed on the citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the pressure should be here. Maybe, I mean, it's very difficult for the government to support people uh, on the other side of the conflict, on conflict like, line, but on this side of the conflict line, after four years of the conflict, mm -hmm. I think the government can ensure that there is access to basically basic services, electricity, gas, me medical facilities, and food, you know, and so on. Healthcare, I mean, so there's the big assessment project by REACH. Uh, mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. So I probably will jump with your difficult question about the political picture. There are um, two problems for it. Uh, now I will explain why. First of all, uh, you need to um, divide, even though sometimes it is very thin line, but not all big businessmen are oligarchs. And uh, the second is that in many regions you have oligarchs which are considered oligarchs only for their own regions, but not on the national level. And these people like a feudal rulers sometimes, and that was especially true for the Eastern Ukraine before. But some of these names are disappearing now, like for example Yaroslavsky, who like before he was in all ratings and with all influence, now when for the last time you heard this name, even in Ukraine. Um, in Odessa region, I can name you few that were fighting with each other. None of them, one is now bankrupt, another one in Russia. So they just disappeared from the map. So it is some kind of changing of this picture. So we are still in this transition. The second is the positive thing about uh, Ukrainian oligarchs that we know who they are, what they own, especially in terms of media outlets. So when I watch one or another TV station, I know who is the owner, and let's say most of the population know. Yeah, there is definitely some, but it's not something that only a few experts know. And that's how I perceive this information or make my choice which of the channels um, uh, to see. Uh, the second issue that definitely um, some of the oligarchs currently prefer just to finance some politicians or political parties, but not to be involved directly. Before 2012, it was not like this. If you go to the members of parliament, many of them were oligarchs. Now they know. They try to do it by other hands. And uh, it has uh, good and bad news, but because it is still continuing, good because sometimes these people are either changing their mind or would like to be more independent than during the elections. The second good news is that we currently is in the process of um, change of the legislation, electoral legislation in Ukraine. First, it was adopted the law on uh, state financing of the political parties. And uh, for what money you received, you also should report. So it's not just these, first of all, uh, uh, particularly um, decreased the level of uh, necessity in oligarchs. And, less of the, uh, and also it gave chance to some small par new parties to, to appear. Uh, the second is now the new legislation is just weak or something is adopted about the uh, um, uh, new system of voting uh, when it should be open lists. It still would be necessary a very huge public campaign explaining to the people what does mean open list because we never had it. But in uh, a long term perspective, it is very good because population would have the access to the to the changes. 
the third news about all this and why the oligarchs like can have difficult times because um, some part of the new generation came to the parliament. Um, a lot of good and bad news about them, so now I'm not going to, um, too much in detail, but the question is that there is additional voices that are ready to speak, not as people used to in the country. Either putting to the public discourse the questions that are at other times members of parliament would prefer to hide, or because they ask different questions, or because they push for some changes about anti-corruption, for example, legislation, some others. It's still not enough of them. They are still minority. But let's say five years ago, we couldn't even imagine such people to appear in the parliament. So it is some hope with these people who are gaining experience now that they would become more marchered in terms of political culture and uh, they would be able to, to uh, change the situation. Now in terms of names, um, it's definitely, as Natalia said, um, People knew whom they elected to vote for Shenga, so he was not perceived that much, uh, or, but to say, he was not perceived as the worst variant of oligarch in Ukraine. First of all, because his uh, money was well known. Most of his money, what is good, it was for the production of something. Because many oligarchs were not liked because they just took like <laughs> national resources and received the contracts in the 1990s that they couldn't. Uh, in his case, like, you know, Chocolate King, it's still psychologically perceived better, yeah, but then the uh, Energy King. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a joke, but it, it, it's played a lot at that time. Then you definitely have Kolomoisky, who is struggling now with, with everything. Um, uh, there are gossips that he's supporting Saakashvili, yet one headache for Ukraine. Uh, we are very hospitable people, but sometimes it's necessary to to behave. <laughs> uh, but that is like putting ahead um, of this. Then you definitely uh, like Ahmedov is is still present in one or another way. That is Mr. Boyko, again the Eastern Ukraine. Um, he just created the new party, so he can appear with a new name at the at the elections. For sure, that is also such people which are not uh, who are not perceived as oligarchs, but in some way they are, like mayor of Lviv. He's not just a politician; he owns quite a number of business. But it was uh, recently published by one of the U.S. senators about the meeting of uh, them with the mayor of Lviv, and mayor Lviv was like. Why you don't make Poroshenko to sell his TV channel? He's like oligarch who is influencing. And the American ambassador just looked and said like, I'm sorry, but if I'm not mistaken, you own several radio stations and TV. Why you are not selling them? So in this case, they were completely the same. But uh, that is, let's say, that is figure to follow because uh, he was seen as the prince in uh, uh, two years ago. Now, with support of Saakashvili, with the uh, uh, few scandals, I mean, it can be like you never know where you go. Um, Mrs. Timoshenko, um, let's be honest, she's oligarch as well in some ways. She was like energy princess, yep. Uh, her family still owns a lot, uh, but she's trying to play on the left card. So she, uh, her statements and program now is much more leftist, uh, socialists. Uh, what is not very good in her Louis Vuitton dresses, uh, I mean, but uh, but that is the uh, tread, uh, like line that she chose uh, um, for the current being. Um, whom else? If you go to the, uh, there are uh, Mr. Kononenko the member of parliament, uh, very active, with not a very good reputation, but he is seen as the presidential man. And there are many others uh, that we are witnessing now, but I can't say you which side they would take, because uh, many elections will be resolved not in Kiev, but at the local level. And here we have a lot of feudal um, rulers. Uh, it is not the level of oligarch business, but uh, people who are very influential in their communities, and they will be those who define, like from their positions it would be, uh, uh, define a lot, especially with this new uh, system of uh, elections. Um, uh, many of these people are started to support small marginal parties, or the parties that appeared like, for example, party of region divided, opposition bloc is what is most well known, 
but it is also party nash krai our land a lot of of the party of regions people who were a little bit more moderate they appeared in this uh, uh, party many of them very controversial but most of them it is these local feudals if i can name them in this way but i don't know how to name them differently uh, and uh, uh, th th this was uh, mr baloga for Zakarpati, he's still a very influential person, but definitely he's not considered anymore as the old national level of um, oligarchs. So let's say it is still um, enough time for the elections. Uh, situation can be changed. Mm, uh, some disturbing factors can appear, including people. I mean, uh, with all the criminal cases happening now, you don't know who would be caught, who not. Avakov, um, he's not the oligarch, he's a businessman, first of all. Because it's difficult to consider him a lot as the civil servant. Uh, he's a man of an hour. I don't know if you have this expression in, uh, in French. I mean, uh, he still behaves as a businessman with the business logic and everything. But uh, for oligarch, for me, it is very clear connection between politics and not power, but politics and money. In his case, it is mostly his own and how he says. But definitely being still at the Yatsenyuk uh, party, he's influencing what is happening there um, and how it's going on. So um, he can be a personality for changing uh, some of the sorts. And he has a lot of power, that's for sure. As the Minister of Interior, that uh, a lot of power. But <coughs> different institutions, you now can't say who is more influential, general prosecutor or Minister of Interior. Truhanov. Truhanov is the former, like for those who don't know, is it is the mayor of Odessa, mm -hmm. the guy with a very specific reputation. He was the military in the past. Uh, then he became a fighter and um, cr quite a criminal biography, but he was also the deputy head of the World Association of uh, Thai Box. Uh, yes, Sam, <laughs> but um, in this case, then, then he became politician, local politician, now he's mayor. Um, he's controversial because he was seen as very pro-Russian. Uh, he is still probably, but as the mil in some way person with the sport uh, background, and Thai box is very special sport, I mean, how it's make your personality. He knows when to shut up, that's what he did. So for the very worst period for the city, he just shut up, not to be kicked off, and started to deal with the small issues of painting the house, doing some others, and stealing money from the budget. <laughs> but, Let's say for the last 100 years, I don't know any mayor in Odessa who was not... We are, in this case, like Chicago. How many of the former governors of Chicago you know who is not in the prison now? If I'm not mistaken, five of the former governors are in the prison now. So sometimes it correlates. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, you want to... um, I think we've covered everything. I was going to say something about offshore zones and gray zones, but I think Natalia... Uh, covered that very well, so maybe we should move on to okay. any other questions. So another round of questions or comments? Hello. Uh, yes, maybe one question about um, uh, returning to Donbass. Um, Two days ago, uh, Vladimir Putin had a first, for first time a direct phone call with a uh, uh, so-called president of uh, DNR and LNR. Um, do you think that this means there, there will be some change in the way uh, uh, Moscow is in interfering in the, in the Donbass? And uh, can we go back to the Minsk agreements? Uh, and uh, I would like you to know how you see the future of the Minsk agreement and of the normal reformer. Because uh, you said uh, the Minsk agreements are dead. But, you know, France and Germany probably will not stay in the WhatsApp, which is dead. I mean, without any results, uh, do you expect that Germany or France can go out of the normal diploma? Uh, and so what will happen? Because you plan to stay just face to face with the Russian Federation. 
Yes, just uh, one question about uh, Ukrainian, let's say, uh, military force uh, forces. Um, you mentioned NATO as, a, as, let's say, as the only way of, uh, of let's say, to make an alliance and, and training, which makes a lot of sense. I just want to have, let's say, your, your view um, about how it's may impact, let's say, uh, the inter internal army protocol. So it's been, let's say, mostly dealing and leading by Russians on the past. So it's been, uh, when do you see that it will make impact, let's say, positively the Ukrainian army, and how it will change, let's say, the brains of the people? Because most of the brain of the people have been, let's say, lead by, let's say, by the previous neighbor. So, so it's it's also a very important factor to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can go. Uh, I will start from the last one because it is a little bit easier. Uh, first of all, about protocols. So we adopt, if you read uh, both military doctrine and other sub-documents, and if you go to the annual national plan and our Ukraine-NATO um, cooperation commission, uh, uh, everything, um, protocols are changing, and uh, many of these things already changed and accepted by army very positively. By the way, if you... We return back for a few years for you to understand. In 2010, in the National Security Doctrine and a few other documents, it was said that Ukraine is non bloc But in military doctrine, till 2012, we were still going to NATO. So uh, military people were the most reluctant to disagree with this because they, they saw the difference. We had too many military exercises to see the difference. So, for example, it's, uh, changes started from the way of the... Uh, um, how you put on the map enemies and friends. Comp now we are using the marking of NATO already. Um, it is to the communication, to the structure of the ministry. We return back to this J and system I mean that NATO countries used. It has come to the issues of um, uh, 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 before we had too many soldiers and too many generals. Now we have several special funds. That's why I said we have 250 projects only for the security sector reform supported by many countries. Sweden, not NATO yet, but they're very active in this as well. So uh, projects are happening uh, that we need the lower level of sergeants. What we almost didn't have, those who make decisions, a lot of generals who are in the positions of the head of battalions, for example, it is changing now. So it is already the process and, as I know, well accepted. Concerning the my, and I can go like further, 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 it's on the all levels is, is happening. Uh, mines, uh, um, more difficult and less difficult. Uh, one thing is that um, a lot of new generation came to army because of the anti-terroristic operation. More and more people who served at the zone of the conflict are now invited for the positions of the Ministry of Defense or even at the Defense Academy because these people are with real expertise, the real knowledge, not only paper knowledge, and uh, it is some kind of encouraging projects for, for them to be, to be present. The second is that many of those who were extremely pro-Russians, they left. When the real war started, and there are still cases uh, of the people who are like uh, spies caught and everything like this process is continuing, definitely. But many of those who were completely pro-Russian, th th they left. Due to the illustration process, due to the voluntarily, some just escaped being afraid of criminal cases. It's like different uh, uh, processes happening. And uh, um, uh, when, uh, like, I haven't heard from anybody that it is the um, opposition to the NATO standards. What is the opposition? It is, and the biggest opposition is happening, not in the protocols. The biggest opposition is in the procurement. The procurement sure. But here it is nothing about Russia or NATO. It is just about money. And here you have, the, when you go to the logistics, it is the biggest opposition. It is still people, I can't tell, people uh, had that much property built because of this, uh, this money. So these people are the real problems, corruption schemes that happen. But I can say that um, fighting at the military sphere with this is the most severe. 
It is very difficult to put politician to court because of this. It is very big support among them to each other. Judges, problem. In military, it is stopped to be tolerated because people understand that their life depends. A lot of attempts still. I don't know, they're still hoping that they can do it, but um, they implemented, uh, they were the first one to implement Prazoro. It is the system of the electronic procurements. Ministry of Defense was the first one to start it, and they uh, saved something like $600 million at the first year only. Um, then you have a huge descent of um, volunteers uh, who work within the ministry exactly with the new type of logistic uniform. So they took all these problematic issues uh, and it's great support. The same with the rent corporation. I mean, a lot of funds are set to do this. So uh, this is happening. Arrests are happening, definitely. Uh, still problems with the equipment in terms of, I mean, Ukrabron uh, Prom. Um, uh, those who are dealing with the arms selling, uh, but there is a different amount of money that is billions, so definitely here it is uh, much more problematic. And the, the, the last is that already five battalions are accredited that they are working completely by the NATO standards. So it is what was reported just recently. Five battalions and like new new battalions are, are, are coming. Um, so for this the process is, is happening quite good. Uh, very quickly from my side about the uh, um, Minsk and Putin call, if, if you don't mind, I will unite them because they are very connected. First of all, um, we were talking before this, uh, Natalia is very sharp with it that it is dead, but I always said that I'm a little bit more uh, positive because I consider it not as a final agreement but as a framework. So, as a framework where you can bring people, and that is where Normandy for Matia exists, uh, it is still something on which you can build on, with all the difficulties that we have, with all the politicization that we have, for sure. But at the same time, uh, uh, what we have there is that you know who to call, and you can make Russians to be present and talk, and to be asked in some way. The same definitely for Ukrainians, but without us, any format would be impossible. Um, I see that now with the recent activities from the United States, it definitely can be some changes because what Kurt Walker is doing, but let's be honest, Russians always wanted to speak with Americans. Uh, they have their role and they hoped for Angela Merkel that she will be very pro-Russian. Very soon she showed that she is not. Yep. So definitely uh, Russians, are, and for them, the war in Ukraine, for a lot it was the war with Western. Not with Ukraine as per se. Yep. So they wanted to. It was the struggle for power against the U.S., for example, or something. That's why. And now negotiations. They think that Ukrainian government doesn't matter. We can agree everything with the with Washington. Uh, that that's why you would see new formats uh, arriving. Uh, I still see positives from Minsk uh, in terms of, because there are groups, yep, not only big meetings that are happening, but it is working groups and talks about exchange, uh, like, I mean, the, the issues are get, uh, the issues that are put there, they are coming to the public. Uh, even that it can have difficulties, but it shows what are the problems and contradictions. So um, it helps sometimes, but with the exchange of uh, like uh, hostages or prisoners, it's always un, uh, um, unequal. I mean, the, uh, now is discussed the variant of 300 that Ukraine should give for 80 people from uh, I, I, other side. I mean, like it's definitely like you understand, it's, it's never equal. Yeah, but we are going for this uh, anyway because we are like perceived. Putin called to Denner and Eleanor. Um, he never lost contact with them. This time it was more public, probably. The issue is that he needs to give additional legitimacy and actorness, if you can name it like this, to these letters. Because uh, most of us definitely perceive that the decision is up to Putin. But Putin always would like to have the... Uh, um, a, uh, emergency exit to say, oh, I would like to do it, but look, those who are in the conflict don't want. So such a calls just before uh, his meetings um, with other people, I mean, like just on after m meeting of Walker with the Surkov, it's just a political jest to show that uh, like 
they are the people with whom we need to consultate about what is happening. Can I just jump in on, on, on Minsk is dead? I think the current agreement is dead, but, but I think that, you know, to echo what Hannah was saying, the format is the only possible format, it has the Russians at the table, has some role for the, for the locals. Um, so I think um, Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 are probably dead, but you know, it is the format in which one could theoretically come up with Minsk 3. Yeah, but without results, it's, it's well, a bit difficult to keep on. Well, sure, but then, I mean, it, look at the, um, to, to go back to the Caucasus, since 2008-9, you've had the Geneva International <laughs> Discussions, <laughs> which, is, which, again, um, they meet four times a year, and they've managed to have agreements on things like, you know, um, um, bugs and. Um, wait, 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 but uh, is it a good example? Well, it, no, no, but I, what, I, what I'm saying is, <laughs> is, is that, that it's, if you've got a format and a, and a means for people uh, to meet, then, you know, then that's better, that's better than leaving a vacuum. I, I think we've seen other conflicts where the, where the format has been, um, has been disassembled and it's been even worse. I mean, we'll, we'll continue because I, I said that Minsk is death. I mean, I was provocative, but I mean, nevertheless, I, what I meant here is a Minsk and the first Minsk and then this protocol of February 2015, it offered some vision of settlement. Maybe not a roadmap, but some kind of vision. And I think there is a very strong opposition in Ukraine towards that vision, as is, as it is seen as imposed on Ukraine in the moment of weakness, because both Minsk, there were um, kind of ceasefire agreements with this vision of settlement, that were adopted when the, um, during the big battles, loss of military, um, uh, Ukrainian military, also civilian casualties, and so on. And that's why, and because also, as a result, all this argument, it's not legitimate because it was signed by people who are not even Ukrainian you know, officials and so on. So, I mean, there is a lot of discussion killing Minsk within Ukraine. I mean, as a legitimacy of the process, but also what is actually there as a settlement. And uh, I also don't believe that Minsk is a good trust building mechanism if you think of the format. I mean, um, basically the, uh, the idea of Russian, and here I come back to the call that um, Ukraine kind of talked to the uh, de facto, so armed groups, I don't know how what to call them, to LPR and DPR, and Ukrainians try to resist it as much as they can. And this happens in, in Minsk as well. I mean, they're kind of, they try to ignore the, these two um, representatives of the republics and try to talk to Russians, and they see Russia as their kind of counterpart. And in that sense, I think even kind of uh, uh, more, there is there is more trust building going on the ground than in Minsk. It's my my okay. kind of uh, feeling. At least I observed there is less popular. Um, I mean, you don't know about it, but it's connected to Minsk, but it's not Minsk. And called call joint coordination and control mechanism. And there are Ukrainian and Russian servicemen mm -hmm. officers working on the ground. And I mean, the generals go to Minsk, but they can solve many issues without going to Minsk. Of course, their mandate is limited to. Like, uh, you know, the ceasefire kind of endorsement so they can repair infrastructure or uh, have some, you know, humanitarian work done. But, I mean, they're amazing. And then, nobody has actually said that there are lots of Russian officers working in Ukraine on government controlled territories. And there's also kind of military presence in a way, right? But it doesn't disturb the, the parties. The same as uh, there are also Ukrainian observers on the um, non government control side. Oh, I mean, I'm not kind of trying to describe Minsk, but I also want kind of to maybe to say that uh, there is no strong commitment in Ukraine, and I think there is less and less commitment to us. What is uh, Minsk as a set as a vision of settlement? And I agree here uh, with Tom that there is a kind of a dis disintegration going on in a way. It's very physical because um, when the electricity lines or gas li pipelines are broken, the government mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't think of immediately negotiating with the other side. Mm -hmm to repair them and then to continue, um, you know, supply through the contact line, they think of alternatives all the time. Mm -hmm. And even like there was a village, a small village in Luhansk region when that happened uh, back in June, until now they couldn't agree on ceasefire. They don't want to request ceasefire. They don't want to repair the uh, uh, gas pipeline. They, they think of alternatives. They want to cut any kind of contact. And this is where I'm afraid it's going on, you know? that uh, I mean, I was talking about, about one region that is kind of connected and people have 
relationship, families, jobs, and access to services, and so on. But what the, what the conflict does to all that, it's, it's this breaks, this links are increasingly getting breaked, broken, and then you have alternative kind of links, and I mean, these parts are drifting apart. In a way. I mean, people, their, their relationship, their family ties, their common kind of original identity, they're what keeps it together, but I mean, you will have several years of that, and then new generations are, are growing and so on. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not against kind of, of disbanding it, but there are many processes that can be for the sake of processes, you know what I mean? Without actual results, and parties are not want kind of to re renounce them officially, not to lose the face, but they will still imitate, you know, lots of activity without actually kind of committing fully heartedly to them. And this is like my um, my worry about Minsk. Mm, uh, and even the exchange of prisoners in Minsk itself, like all fall, that's it. What to negotiate? <laughs> you exchange all fall, that's it. But they they always they talk about figures. These figures are changing. They continue talking about it, and people are still suffering. The families still don't know what is going on to their beloved ones, and so on. You know? uh, so even they can't even solve a small kind of small. I mean, there's yeah, humanitarian issues that uh, affect people's lives. Um, and here I want to come back to uh, also what Tom said about this disintegration and uh, the sense of new identity being kind of created in this uh, in both sides. Because I think Ukrainian uh, Donbass is getting more Ukrainian people kind of feel more affiliated to, towards Ukraine, even though they feel that maybe in Kiev they don't care about them. But still, I mean, I mean they're exposed to different informational sources. I mean, in both sides they watch Russian media, but in in uh, armed group controlled territories and even close on the you know in the Ukrainian territory, on the close to the contact line, people don't have access to Ukrainian TV or Ukrainian radio. I mean, they watch different kind of sources. They they may know that. What it's shown that it's not exactly the reflection of the reality, but this is what they watch. And on the other side, I mean, people still have access to Russian media, but they're also much more exposed to Ukrainian media, and they have a little bit different picture. And also, it's a matter of what you, I mean: children going to schools, national holidays, the money that you use. You know, um, uh, in in both in, in so-called DPR and LPR, they have basically parallel structures created. They have different legislation. They have like different criminal code. They used the Soviet criminal code added some parts of. You know, some innovations, to, they have death panels. I mean, it's kind of, they, uh, it, it's a different institutional legal frameworks being formed on those territories. And then one issue that I haven't talked about, it's about transitional justice. Imagine you have elections, and if in the, you elect all those people and they have kind of to integrate mm -hmm. back to Ukraine, what you would do? For Ukraine, all of them are terrorists or war criminals, you know? And uh, the concept of transitional justice is something that only discussed uh, you know, among think tankers, like lawyers, human rights defenders, but they don't talk about it. But there is some tra transitional justice going on in the sense that there are many uh, trials uh, in absentia against uh, uh, heads of so-called courts of DPR, police of DPR. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, those people know that they are in Ukraine, they are wanted people, you know, and um, they will have verdicts, and means once they're arrested, they should go to Ukrainian jail. So. I think that the problem is that there is no trust between the parties, and the Minsk doesn't kind of help to build this trust. It's not the proper um, kind of arrangement, and the trust that on the ground. I mean, there are some kind of there are no proper mechanisms, let's say. And also, you know that um, Ukrainian government. I mean, many people who work in administration, even in Donetsk regional civil administration, they're from Donetsk. They're IDPs. They go to see their families there. But there were cases when someone was arrested, there were cases of judges who were IDPs serving in Luhansk arrested. So, and this also affects people, people's contracts, the visions, and so on. So in the, in the end, there, there, this disintegration is taking place. I mean, there are very, I mean, Ukrainian um, polling companies, they don't have access to um, the other side of the contact line, but there was this poll that I mentioned this morning, conducted last uh, December by, um, Center for European Studies of Euro Eastern Europe in Berlin, and they conducted this poll on identities um, in both sides of the contact line, and they noted that people in on the non-government control side that they feel they, they feel more the original identity, and they feel less Ukrainian citizens than five years ago, while on the other side it's other way they feel more Ukrainian citizens and less kind of original identity, and this is like uh, back then it was uh, three years of conflict even less. Imagine this, this is reinforced. They, they also have the, the school, the children in school. They go to school with different textbooks. The interpretation of history, it was already a kind of very problematic issue in Ukraine, the interpretation of past, the collective memories, and so on. And I mean, this, these things are happening. There are some kids who still want, I mean, their parents want them to have proper education, so they are enrolled in this. Uh, so-called DPR and LPR schools, and then they have involved some distant learning in Ukraine, and then 
one day they can go and pass exams and uh, go to Ukrainian universities, but again, it's also sometimes an issue of money if parents can afford that. But the majority of kids, they will still, I mean, will, cons will be exposed to only to one system of education. And this, this will kind of build this, the more the conflict goes, the more this kind of separation, unfortunately, despite the fact that communities are so interlinked, will, will happen. I mean, gladly there is no kind of ethnicity map in, but in a way, the conflict also kind of promoted this ethnicization, maybe to less degree, but still. And uh, the point that I wanted to make also, um, I mean, you can afford a dead Minsk process if you have a so-called frozen um, conflict when nobody's dying, like in Transnistria or in Abkhazia now, or in, I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, there, there, there were escalations, but um, but you cannot afford a dead negotiating a process when every day you have civilian dying, military dying on both sides of the conflict, and they're all Ukrainian citizens, most of them. I mean, even if they're armed group members, they're still Ukrainian, Ukrainians dying every day there. Uh, or if they're still civilians who kind of uh, are treated as separatists by, by Kiev increasingly, but they're still Ukrainian civilians living on the other side. You can't, you can't have a dead negotiating process for, for many years if you have ongoing, ongoing war. And m m my worry is that sometimes, uh, I mean, how the media show the conflict and how the government tries to show the conflict is it's something that is given, it's some happening somewhere there, we don't kind of watch, we don't see, we don't know. And then um, there is also, I must say, there's very little pressure on the government. Uh, like there are no anti-war movement in Ukraine, nothing like that. Uh, I mean, people say, uh, I mean, there are people who say let's look for reconciliation, dialogue, and so on. But it's not like you have protests and saying let's stop the war. You don't because any process like this would be accepted as a progression, position. Mm -hmm. Because in this mm -hmm. case, like people are explaining that we haven't started this uh, war, so you don't even have this in the minds of the people. Uh, usually the very pacifistic ideas are coming from those who are either with a great position or with a pro-Russian position. Because uh, many people are saying that Ukraine is defending their country, so as soon as you are defending your country, how you can stop doing it if the aggression has not been stopped. So uh, to expect any kind of the uh, uh, peace marches or something like this, definitely you can't, because otherwise um, it, it would be perceived completely as you propose to stop defending your national uh, sovereignty. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. But at the same time, I mean, the, what happened back in August, for example, 2014, when there was incursion of Russian troops and it was looked like exactly, you know, defense against uh, foreign country aggression. Now it's a kind of position where they, they, the contact line is more or less stable. They shoot at each other, they engage. I mean, I, I, so for me, it's very difficult to understand the logic of why they sometimes shoot, sometimes they don't, how escalations go. I mean, uh, I also talk to a CP where they also don't understand why sometimes you have, like, for example, we always expected the uh, uh, escalations uh, in August, but this August it didn't happen. It happened in October. So, I mean, there's some logic in that. Well, but what I'm trying to say is that um, the, when you have an ongoing conflict and people are dying every day, it's very difficult to find excuses for long term, you know, why you're doing that to your own people. And mostly those who are suffering are not Russian citizens, the citizens of Ukraine that are suffering mostly from that. And uh, there are many attempts to hijack discussion to say, oh, we need this uh, biscuit admission, but it's not, Russia doesn't want that, what we want. But I think the essence is not about that. You know? and, but unfortunately, I don't know, I don't see any kind of end site. I think like that it can long, I mean, it, it, it was uh, since 2015 when the Minsk, uh, second Minsk agreement was adopted, which has been almost three years, and nothing drastically changed, neither on the ground, nor in government policy, only by, but, but my feeling that there's like, um, more and more people are ready to sacrifice this territory for the sake of, you know, bigger Ukraine. This is kind of how I see it. It started kind of being discussed before it wouldn't be discussed. They would say, no, we are patriots, it's our country, we are one country, one nation. And now I feel some people start discussing it. Maybe so far not seriously, but still. But in this case, just, just last phrase, like, it's very good comparing with Georgia in this case. It doesn't matter how long these territories are separated and how strong, uh, none of the politician would be able to say that he is ready to give up this um, and to be elected. It would be impossible, even if some are telling, like, we forgot when we saw South Ossetia or Abkhazia being part of, but for any politician to say that they give up with a part of their territories, it will be political suicide. So. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. uh, how many generation pass in Georgia uh, still? And I would say even more, uh, the younger generations who um, who was born already and raised in the situation of conflict, uh, for them it would be even more difficult because they all the time and this they, they haven't seen different situation. And that's what we see in Caucasus that younger generation is much more nationalistic and pro war than the, the, the older generation sometimes. Not in Georgia, but, yeah. Not in Georgia, but, but in Azerbaijan in, in, and Armenia, yes, yeah. go there. Younger generation are crazy, yeah. they are yeah, completely against the peace process. Mm -hmm. In Georgia, it's just that none of the political parties raised the question of Abkhazian South City during the latest elections. Of course, it's become very low. The Sakashvili is coming in all the ratings, like it was the third or fourth question. Like first is job creation, healthcare, mm -hmm. and then uh, and territorial integrity. Now, because the government is also less speaking about that, it went down. Yeah. And also because with the recognition, the hopes are just... Mm -hmm. like, but nobody Plus, would say, let's forget about it. No, but within 20 years, I would not bet on that. Uh -huh.